welcome to the London BSCN store. And right here, we're in the Beehive, ready for a brand new conversation, all about a brand new panel series. And today's conversation is the importance of sport with an all-female panel. So let me get into it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome in to my right. I've got Shanice, England's Commonwealth Games silver medalist and also head coach at the Kingston Lions. Let's go, Shanice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Over on this side, someone that we have not sat down and done a panel with is shocking. We've got Moji, Bricks and Top Cats girls head coach and also senior coordinator at Lillian Bayless. Let's go, Moji. Let's go. Go, 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 go. And to my left, you want to speak to the manager? We've got the manager on deck. Here we've got an athlete, an artist, and also someone who's all about the self-care and Jordan ambassador is Sevian Witter. Let's go. So, this is very, very exciting, and my first question has to be this. What is your biggest win as a female in your sport? Shanice, I want to come to you oh, first. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think it's just, I think over the years, I've been fortunate enough to have some female ro role models in my life, and I think it's just having that, that person to look up to and knowing that there's no limits for me because I've seen a number of people come before me and do it and reach every area that I want to get to. Yeah. I think, yeah, having those role models, seeing them, especially now, like on TV and all different places, social media, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, nice. We're going to come back to role models, actually. Moji, what about yourself? You've got bare stories, man. Come on, give me the tea. It's funny because like, she's sitting there speaking about, you know, how she's like come up and stuff. And I remember watching Shanice when she was like this. And I was like, yeah, she's, she's, she's going to be something. And just as she was speaking just now, like, you just remind me of like a little Michelle Brown, like just mad talented. And it's just like, I just hope it's nurtured and I just hope like it's recognised. Do you know what I mean? So I think for me um, on this panel, just because it is Sevian and it is Shanice, it's nice to see the impact that the women before me, with me, around me and upcoming are still pushing and I think that's what makes it really special for me to be a woman in sport, knowing that it hasn't stopped to any generation, it's, it just keeps filtering through and it's getting better and better and better as the time goes on. So. Yeah, best sound bites, let's go, let's go. <laughs> Sebian, talk to me. Um, similar to what Coach Moji was saying. Oh, easy, just Moji. <laughs> She said, in this capacity... Moji, it's similar to what Moji was saying, seeing those women when I was growing up, because I didn't see too many. Mm -hmm. And, like, Coach Michelle Brown, one of the pe first people who actually broke down a crossover to me. Like, I would go on YouTube and watch, uh, like, basketball players in the NBA do a crossover. And then when I was at the Bottle Camp and I saw Coach Michelle doing, I was like, God has got sauce too, like, we can do that. And so being able to see women in that space being able to represent and, and things like that was really special. And, and to see where it's taken me now, we've got a phrase at BS10, it's like, thank you, basketball. Mm. And I literally have to say, thank you, basketball, because it's helped me get to this space. The kind of like, character it's built yeah. has helped me to develop those skills necessary to overcome these things, to get yeah. in that space. Yeah, absolutely. One of the questions I want to ask later on is about the DNA of basketball and how it just kind of spills out into everyday life. But I want to reverse it all the way back and just know what's your stories for those who are watching at home, for those who are players, for those who are like, how do you get into your sport? Where did it all begin for you? For me, it was my brother. He's actually here right now. Oh, show your brother yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, guys. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he, uh, he lived and breathed basketball, like, mm -hmm. taking the ball everywhere with him. And I was that annoying little sister. Like, where are you going? Like, what are you doing? And yeah, I kind of got into it that way. But when it, when it really like got serious, I didn't like playing with her anymore. Like we still have a rivalry now <laughs> of who's the better player. Um, no, it was him. And fortunately enough, like I had, I had, like I said, I had those role models and I was, I was able to have like good coaching and coaches that actually cared about me as a person and not just a basketball player or someone that can make them look good on the court. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to like represent England and stuff like that growing up, played for a number of different teams, like Harry Gay, Youngbloods, Eastside, been all about, um, and I've been able to travel like to a number of different places. But like, I think just my brother and my mom, and like shout out Caroline Charles as well, because she's put a lot into my journey and still supports me. Yeah. Like I'm her own kid. <laughs> but yeah, it's, even, I feel like I've done so much, even though I'm only 25, but oh. no, it's been... <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's been a good like I've se I've seen you like through all these years like there's so many faces that I come across now and it's like mm. like you guys have known me since I was tiny yeah. <laughs> and yeah I'm still here doing it so thankful to a lot of people but yeah, it's the grind, man. Yeah, fully, fully, fully. And I love that you're sitting opposite one another because you must be thinking back to so many sessions or so many times you're just like, wow, Shanice. But there's a joy in that, right? There's a joy in seeing someone's journey. And to, for you to come full circle and now be the girls' head coach, I mean, where did it all begin for you? Um, I was a very athletic person, so I did so many different sports. Um, and you know what it's like in school? Uh, let's, let's, and I was in a girls' school as well, so you know, like if you're good at sport, you know you're getting, you're doing this, you're Football, doing this, you're, do, you're, you're doing, everything. you're doing cross country. <laughs> huh? I don't even like cross country, but you're doing it. Yeah. So, you know, athletics was actually my first, my first love. Um, basketball was the side chick, um, and then not the side chick. Yeah, basketball was the side chick, and then winter made me make that decision. I was like. I'm really not cut out to be running track in this kind of weather. Basketball's indoors. I think that's, you know, where it's going to go. And Andrea Norton came to my school, ran a couple of sessions, came to Brixton. I was like, no, that ain't for me. It's a bit much. I went to Peckham, ended up coming back to Brixton. And as they say, like, you know, the rest is history. I literally walked in and um, I found a home, found a family. Um, and that family's grown and expanded like just tenfold over the years. And I don't think people outside of basketball really understand when we say basketball family, you know, it's easy to just drop the word family and, and people be like, oh, you know, it's just something that you say in the sport. But in the UK, especially, if you're in the basketball family, you really have found something special that it can, no other sport can emulate it. I, I don't know how to articulate it any better, but there's no other sport that can emulate the love, the support that you get being in basketball. And that support doesn't come from the institution. That support comes from the grassroots, like the Caroline Charles, like the Andrea Norton's, like the Jimmy Rogers, like the Mike Carty's, like the Joe White's. It comes from those people in the community. Um, and at some point, we've been rivals. And I say rivals, I coached a team that played against, and I'm like, damn, man, I ain't got no... <laughs> Who gonna guard that girl over there? Like, you know, and I'm sitting there hating, thinking, eh, she's, she's, she's about it, you know? Um, so, like, yeah, my journey started, like, way back when in school, and, and it's just continued. Um, and once you're in it, I mean, like, you started your coaching journey at, at Kingston Lions. I mean, that's just... That's, that's now your path. That's, that's, that's going to be your thing. So you're not just a player. Like, all those things that you learn, you start to give back. And, and that's just how it kind of trickles down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before I get to your story, Sev, what is Moji like as a coach? It's OK, it's OK. <laughs> it's a safe place. <laughs> I'm coming to you, Nick, for your answer as well, because i got stories. No, to be honest, like, the type of coach... Like, obviously, I wasn't, like, directly coached by her, but... We mentioned Caroline Charles, like the type of coach that cares about you mm. as a person and not just a player. Yeah. And like you can tell that by the way they coach. And that's, I think I've taken that myself with my coaching. Like it's not just about, I want you to be able to make a layup and make this three point shot. Like yeah. I want you to trust me. I want you to have confidence in yourself. I want you to build your self esteem while you're here. Even if you don't play basketball mm. after this season, like as long as you leave a better person, like that's. That's what I see. Yeah, that's a great point. Just because Moji was giving me the Intel seven one 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 time where she was like, "You're selfish, Sevi, and you're selfish." Oh, yeah. And so, did, did, did you leave as a better player, as a better person? We need to break down the context. <laughs> What's your side? What's your side? This, the other side of the story. So I am far from selfish. And so <laughs> when she said this, I was so triggered because I was like, "This is a blatant lie." What do you mean? <laughs> but the type of coach Moji is is she will find those little trigger points to activate you on the court and she knew that about me and sometimes not just in basketball but in life and in the workspace sometimes I need or I have needed other people to recognize my talent or believe in me mm -hmm. and then I'm like oh snap and so in that moment on the court Moji needed me to attack be aggressive yeah. get to the basket and I was being super unselfish and she was like no, it wasn't just that you were nice. <laughs> Too nice. She's, Sevian is such a nice person, like genuinely on and off the court. 
So like she'd do a move and like it'd be nice. I'm like, I don't need it nice. <laughs> I need you to, I need you, to, I need people to respect you. Like, and for her, it was just like, yeah, but you know, I'm doing this. Like she was the an one junkie before the an one, you know, like just all the moves. And I'm sitting there with a the coach like, how can I get this aggression, not even aggression, there's a fire inside of her, but I don't think she knows it's there. Like, at the moment, she's just floating on the surface. Like, how can I trigger it? And like I said, she's so nice on and off the court, and she knows that she's nice. So I'm going to tell her something that's untrue, yeah. you know? I'm going to tell her she's a selfish ass player, and I know she's going to hate that. Yeah, it's going to burn the fire though. It's going, it's going, to, it's going to light that fire. I was so vexed. We, we used to go in this little cupboard in Brixton Rec, where Jimmy would just shut the door and we would just have our team talk. And Modi said that, I was like, all right, I'll show you who's selfish. Mm. Yeah, okay, cool, when we step out there, I was a different player in the second half, but um, yeah, that stuck with me for a long time. But yeah. once, you know, the fog had left. I, w I recognised what just had happened in that moment and the type of coach that you were and what you was getting out of me. And then I've noticed it throughout like my journey, those different moments, doing things that I didn't want to do um, and stepping out of my comfort zone and needing those people to kind of pull me out of my comfort zone. Like even being on a panel like this, like yeah. everyone can like, I've been moaning all day, but I needed people to pull me out and it's like, you, you should be there, you should do this, you should like bring you into these spaces so yeah. you've got something to say. Yeah. And so um, now thank you for being a coach in my life who was able to trigger me, but it was for the Thanks best. Thanks for staying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then once. <laughs> it's, it's having someone who's got your best interests at heart and it's coming from a loving place. Mm -hmm. And that's what Moji had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just because you mentioned family and you mentioned your brother, I know your family and your brothers played a key role in you starting where you started as well. So how did it all begin, your love for basketball, Seth? Yeah, so we actually grew up playing football. I'm the oldest of six. Mm -hmm. um, and so at the, I'm the uh, girl, three boys, two girls. And so my brothers, we all played together. Um, played football together in the garden and then we went to a basketball game at the end of the basketball game with London Towers they gave out free basketball mm -hmm. and so we in the garden just playing with it and they were like oh by the way we got sessions on a Monday went down and the, the rims were lower so we could dunk and I was like ah oh, you know this basketball is fun <laughs> and so we start we start playing basketball and then slowly similar to what Moji was saying we had to make a decision mm. outdoors football cold Slide tackling, mm -mm. <laughs> okay. Basketball indoors, warm, mm. games on the weekends. Yeah, that sounds good, okay. So we made the switch over to basketball and like every day in the garden with my brothers, just dribbling, practicing. I would get mad at like going to do work because I was two at home. So I'm doing work, but my little brother who's like four, I could see him still practicing in the garden. I'm like, he's getting extra time. <laughs> I was like, oh. So we, we really loved it, and at the time I was the tallest. I was like this height at 12, so they've all outgrown you now. Yeah, just. Yeah, I didn't really grow too much. So I, I really thought I was going to be the first woman to dunk. I really thought that was about to happen <laughs> in, in the UK, but it didn't, it didn't work like that. So growing up with them, like practicing every day in the garden, like just move, move, move until the lights went out, just researching on YouTube, like, moves, basketball players. Um, I even like, created my own little website at the time with, with like, little YouTube clips. Um, yeah, I was even watching like plyometrics. I was really, I was really trying to dunk. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just having that, that camaraderie with my brothers, I really, that really helped. Mm. And then the people that we were around, like, I didn't really see myself as any different to the guys. It was just, um, playing a sport. Mm. I didn't really see a differentiation between a woman's sport or men's sport. Mm. Um, and so I was playing with the boys up until 14 and that's when at London, Lewis and Thunder at the time, we didn't have any more girls and it was a brand new club. So it was a decision either stop playing basketball or find a new club. Mm. And that's when I went to Brixton Top Cats, um, which was the closest team. And I'd seen the girls play before actually at an event. And so seeing that representation and being like, oh, that's actually... It was the Daryl Dawkins event, um, Dawkins on event at, South South Bank. at South Bank. I saw you and I was like, she's going to be playing at Brixton. Like, <laughs> I didn't say nothing to you and I oh. said to Vanessa, Accra, Shara and all of them. I said, 
we're going to get her. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know the time. Scouting. Yeah, trust me. I don't have, I don't get that girl over there. Yeah, but being able to come to Brixton, it was definitely a different um, journey for me because it was like, oh, I don't know if you should be going to Brixton by yourself at this time of night. And um, being able to have the work ethic at Brixton definitely helps develop that kind of shell yeah. of like a toughness where you're able to like handle a lot more. Mm. And so I definitely thank being part of Brixton Top Cats for that and how it's developed me as a person and my character and just pushing yourself beyond what you actually want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that leads me so nice into this next question because I want to know, just as young girls growing up, how has basketball allowed you to unlock skills or unlock things in your mind that's been like, okay, I'm not on court now, but I'm on court in my head. For me, it's more, I learned how to handle people. Mm. Um, like everyone has their story, everyone has their thing that they're going through, even if it's just like they had no milk this morning to make their cereal and now they're having a bad day. Like yeah, yeah. you can't, you just need to know how to communicate with people and be patient with people. Mm. And especially on the basketball court, like for us, we practice like every day. We see each other for like three hours straight some days and like traveling where we have like long trips and stuff like that. You're spending a lot of time with a small group of people and it can be, it can be a lot sometimes, especially all being women. Yeah. <laughs> it can be a lot, but like after a while, you need to know that just not, not everyone's the same. Everyone has their own things going on, whether it's to do with basketball, whether it's personal, and you just need to take time. And the same thing applies to people on the street. Like you can walk and bump into someone, like take time, don't get angry. Like, apologize because they could be having the worst day of their life yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah especially like for myself as well it's taught me to be more vocal mm -hmm. when I'm having a bad day or I'm not at my best so people know like I might just need you to speak a little softer to me today yeah 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 that's so true because if there's one thing about Sevian that I will know when Sevian needs a break Sevian will find herself on a plane to <laughs> wherever and you're like Sevian's gone she's 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 checked out so what is that about is that a basketball thing is that something that you learn because obviously you need to rest that's part of the the athlete's routine I get that but for creatives who are watching and thinking we're not good at rest we're not good at taking time just for ourselves but you're quite good at that Sev so I wondered if that was a basketball finding a learning or if that was just you um, I'm not really practicing it right now. <laughs> However, it is a vital part of being my optimal self. Mm -hmm. And I learned that mostly from my past injury um, and really deep diving into wellness and different, different types of therapies, yeah. not just therapy for your mind, but like physiotherapy, like heat therapy, cryotherapy, different kinds of wellness techniques that will help you and really discovering the importance of sleep. Mm -hmm. And so now I wear this ring that helps like understand your sleep patterns. And I really found out it was like the foundation of um, like making good decisions and even like for recovery. Mm -hmm. um, as athletes, recovery is a key thing, but on the court, but off the court as well. Similar to what Shanice was saying and having a patience for people when you don't have like proper wellness or recovery time, you have a shorter like mm -hmm. fuse and just learning those techniques um, and learning more about myself, trying to catch that balance yeah. where you can. And if you can't, if you don't have that balance, being able to communicate with the people around you, mm -hmm. um, the skills from being on court and being with a team is knowing that in order to be a successful team, you're gonna have to do the little things, the smaller details and that energy as well, um, similar to being um, on, a, on a team you've got someone who's going to be the top scorer, mm -hmm. but you're going to need someone who's a rebounder. You're going to need someone who's on the bench cheering for your team. Mm -hmm. You could be the top player, but if you come to the bench and you're just like, not even interacting with your teammates, then that energy is going to trickle down. Yeah. So you need to have people on the team who are going to be able to play different roles mm -hmm. and match that. And that's, that's what I've, I've learned being on different teams. Everyone has a role. Mm -hmm. um, today you might be the top scorer, but this game we might just need you to to rebound or mm -hmm. you're on four fouls, you're gonna have to sit down and, and not be upset about it. Like mm -hmm. there's different things that you learn from being on a team that you can have crossover into your life mm -hmm. that will help you be a better person 
and have that good energy for everyone around you, not just for yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Mojie, what's, what's basketball taught you most about yourself? As we know, basketball is still a sport that's trying to establish itself in the UK, right? So, like, when I, when I started, if we think about where we are today, like, and where we were, you know, you didn't, we didn't have a bench of 12. <laughs> Sorry, it was 10 back then. The bench was 10. Um, so sometimes you'd look on the bench and there's no sub and you'd be on four fouls. The coach is telling you, you're going like this and the coach is like, who? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Who, who's coming on for you? Mm -hmm. So you very quickly learn to have grit. Like, and at times where you don't think, like where you feel your body's really going to shut down, your mind pushes you to another place where you don't have a choice. You cannot shut down. You have to keep going. Mm -hmm. And when that translates, when that translates um, into life and into society, and now this is the real, this is real talk. As a black person, that triggers. You cannot stop. You have to keep going. Mm -hmm. Because who else is going to do that? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for me, it's about like not giving up. There's many times where I've just thought, this coaching thing is long. I'm not playing anymore. So I want my weekends back. I want my evenings. But then I'm like, hmm. If Andrea um, thought like that, if Jimmy thought like that, if Caroline thought like that, if Michelle Brown thought like that, then actually, where would I be? Mm -hmm. So then you've got to start thinking, there's a reason and your journey, there's a reason why you do things. And for me, the takeaway is whatever it is that I'm doing, no matter how hard it gets, no matter what situation arises, if I start something, I'm going to finish it. And I, I have no choice. There's, there's no second option. Um, and I think that's been my biggest takeaway. And I, I take that into work. Yeah. Like whatever I start, I'm going to finish. And I'm going to finish it damn well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about work as a senior coordinator over at Lillian Bayless. We see you, Lillian Bayless. You must have the, the sight of seeing both sides, right? Like in a teacher capacity, in a coach capacity, but also just being around young girls. What do you say to them if they don't have that prior experience? How, how do you get someone who is on the verge of giving up to being like, no, don't, because there's much more on the other side of that? Um, sometimes it's not even a case of um, like talking. Mm -hmm. Actions speak louder than words. Yeah. So a lot of the time, you've got to be very conscious because you never know who's watching you. You, you never know. Um, so my thing is, it's about leading by example and letting the kids know that I'm here. Mm. I'm here. And I think there's no better way than, rather than talking about it, be about it. Mm. Uh, that's, that's the best answer I can give. I can, sit, I can sit here, oh, well, you know, we do assemblies, or, and I talk to this yeah. person, and, and we do that workshop. That's all generic. Mm. The bottom line is, be that representative, be that person, be about it, and be visual, yeah. and be visible to those young girls that need it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk about sacrifice because regardless of where you sit on this conversation, whether you're playing, whether you're not, whether you're about culture, vibes, and whatever it is, everyone's got to give up something for what they want to do, right? So, I, go on then, go for it, go for it. But, but my, my curveball question is, where is the fine line between sacrifice and something just being toxic? Because sometimes you're actually out here trying to put your all in and it's not benefit, like you need to look after yourself, like self-care, woo, 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 woo. But actually, sometimes you're like, no, this is sacrifice and I've got to do this to get to this level. So how do you define that fine line between sacrifice and something that's toxic? And what have you given up so that you can reach the next level in, in, in whatever field that is? Should you let me come to you first? Sorry, let me let Moji think. To be honest, I don't think I've intentionally sacrificed like too much. Um, more recently, like kind of on what Sevin was saying about like the mental wellness, the physical wellness, I've taken it upon myself to put myself first more recently. Oh, and what does that look like? Um, like when I'm actually tired, yeah. I'm telling everyone I'm tired. Like <laughs> yeah. guys, like if it's in practice on the court, guys, I'm tired, mm -hmm. like it helped me out. Like, if I'm 
if my body isn't feeling 100, like I'm being vocal, not just, oh, I'm gonna just t take these extra reps, like just because I can. But at the same time, I make sure I'm doing justice to people who can't. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if someone's like Sevian's gone through an injury and people have gone through injuries to where they actually can't play anymore, mm -hmm. and I actually can. So uh, there's like that in between of, there's people who can't, so I need to do it for them, mm -hmm. but I need to make sure I do it well. So let me take care of myself at the same time. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I just, I feel like there, there is that in between. Like at times I feel like I've sacrificed my mental a little bit by not being vocal. Mm -hmm. But as I said, like more recently, it's being more expressive and knowing that I can trust my teammates to take care of me when I'm in that position as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And just to jump to you, Seb, when have you felt most taken care of? I think um, in terms of care, I would give a shout out to my family. Mm -hmm. My little sister's here. When I went through my injury, like I went back home and they made me like bagels in the morning, mm -hmm. took care of me. And that really helped, just took a little bit of a weight off your shoulder. Mm -hmm. So you're able to just focus on one thing, mm -hmm. um, especially in those moments where you might be feeling like, oh, you might be in a, in a spiral. Sometimes you just need that extra help. And sometimes you also need to be able to communicate that. Mm -hmm. And similar to what Shanice said, sometimes you just need to go to bed, yeah. let people know. If I'm not feeling too great today, let people know mm -hmm. so they can be there to help you mm -hmm. and allow people to help you as well. But especially because it's a team sport, right? How do you avoid the feeling of I'm letting my team down? It's tough. It's very tough. I don't know. I don't... Avoid it? Uh, I don't think you can really avoid it too much, but it's what happens afterwards. Like, okay. I'll be honest, like I literally said that to my teammates probably two months ago. I said, guys, like I feel like I'm disappointing you guys, letting you down, like not taking care of myself at the moment. And the response I got was far from what I thought it was gonna be. Like literally everyone just came over and hugged me. Yeah, yeah. And like people check on me like regularly, like how are you doing? Like mm. everything okay? You can't really avoid it, but just how you respond afterwards, yeah. I think, is the most important thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You've got people in your corner. Yeah. Oh, I'm just listening to... <laughs> <laughs> no, because... Um, every, every day and, like, every situation, like, you're always learning. Mm -hmm. um, and just listening to, you know, two of you speaking about, like, self-care, like, to me, that's amazing that you're young adults, you're young women, and you understand the importance of that. You know, like, I'm still learning that. So I'm learning something from you guys. It's a, t it's a takeaway. Like, I'm, I'm not gonna know it all, regardless of the age difference between us and what experience, because there's certain things that you've experienced that I, in my wildest dreams, have never experienced. Same with you, Sevian. So sometimes, like, if I'm sitting here on the panel, I'm just like, I'm just like okay, I'm a, I'm a lock in on that one. I'm a lock in on that one. Um, and I think that's the beauty of this, um, is the constant learning that takes place. And that constant learning allows for growth, allows for development, um, and allows for what I know each one of you guys and myself, what we're pushing for is for the continuous generations of young women coming through and the continuous generations of young black women who live and have come from um, circumstances that may not be so easy. Um, how, do they, how do they navigate their way through that? I think is, you know, is so important. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, on the subject of importance, and given that this conversation is all about the importance of sport, I'm going to switch up the last question. It would be too easy to say to you guys, who's been your role model or who are you still looking up to? I want to know who's been your most unlikely role model. Now, that can be someone within the sport. It can be someone within culture. It can be someone wherever you want to go with it. But who's taught you something that you're like, rah, I didn't expect that to come from that person. And given that we love to, you know, celebrate people here at BSCN, and this is all about female empowerment as well. Who is that person who's been that most unlikely role model in your life that's given you that key? You look can start with this one. I need to think for a second. I'm sitting here like, that's oh, a... I don't think unlikely. I've ever been asked that before. That's, you definitely get that curve. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to say I can't... 
I can't pinpoint it to one person. And my, my reasoning behind that is, if I can solely pick one person, then I'm actually saying that that one person's immaculate and perfect, and that's untrue. So I think my, my idea of perfection or my, um, what's the word you used? The person that's inspired me or a role model, um, I've taken bits and pieces from, from everyone. So you try and take the best part of everyone that you meet to like really build, build yourself up and make your own journey. So I'm gonna say I learn every single day from the young people that I work with, the people around me, the people that have come before me, the people that are coming after me. And um, yeah, just, just young people. Like, quick funny story. Um, I went through something quite traumatic recently and I was with my, my friend's daughter. She's 10 years old. And um, she was asking me questions. And it was so weird because I couldn't lie to her. <laughs> she's 10, but the, these questions she's asking me, they're big girl questions, they're big women questions. And I'm like, how do I answer this? I'm like, okay, you know what? She's asking me big women questions. I'm gonna give her the response I feel like she deserves. And you know, at the end of it all, she says, um, auntie, you know what? Don't worry about it. It's all, it's all good. And she genuinely, I'm looking at her thinking, God damn, like <laughs> this 10 year old girl has made me feel like so special and so cared for. Um, and I learned, I, I learned something from that. You know, in her own tiny little mind, in, in, her, own, in her own way, her own minute understanding, she's made, Sense of something. She's made sense of nonsense. Your life, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they're really becoming hard at you. You're like, okay, life is laughing. Life is laughing. Wow. So that, yeah, those are the stories I want because I just think it's beautiful when it's something so unlikely. It gives us room to then think, what are those small moments in my life? You know, it doesn't, doesn't sometimes need to be the big, big things. It can just be those fine-tuned moments as well. You look like you're still thinking. No, no, she got me, you okay, know. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. No, um, like, the kids, yeah. like they literally, they're so simple but so complex at the same time. Like they see the world in such a, in such a regular way and they don't overcomplicate things when they talk. Like if you come somewhere with a problem, it's simple, straightforward. Yeah. The answer is A, B or C. There's no X, Y, Z about yeah. it. And I think just that, like sometimes the questions they ask are just the way they tell stories and how free their mind is, mm -hmm. like that's, that's something special that I would tell them, like, don't let go of. Like, don't let this world make you, like, put you in this box because you don't need to be in it. Like, you're not gonna get very far that way. And uh, one kid in particular, actually, he, um, he can be pretty hard on, hard on himself in practices and stuff like that. Like, he missed shots and, like, he'll just not wanna play anymore. And I get, like, fairly anxious myself. And I think just coaching him and coaching him to, to understand himself and how to get over that has helped me. And it's made me take a step back and be like, okay, Shanice, how, how much time you take with this kid, the way you pull him to the side, the way you tell him, don't worry, shoot the next shot, and the way you're patient with him, do the same thing with yourself. Yeah. Like, why should it be any different just because you're an adult? Right. Adult, mm. I'm a 12 at heart, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, it shouldn't be any different. Mm. So like the same, back to talking about patience, yeah. but like, yeah, I think these kids are special and it gets to a certain point where we stop thinking like them, which I don't think we should because they, there's so much freedom mm. in being a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, lo I love these answers, man. <laughs> gems on gems on gems. So, Vian, what about yourself? Who's been your most unlikely role model that's given you that, that key? I, I can't, like, I've been listening to the stories I'm really trying to think at the same time, but I don't really have an unlikely role model, but I've been really, like, my heart feels warm seeing the growth of my people around me, mm -hmm. my friends around me, even summertime, playing the one-on-one in the park with, with, against Shanice. I was like, okay, she done a shot, box out. She's already got the rebound. I'm like, whoo, okay, let me just sit back down. But seeing, seeing everyone around me grow, um, turn on the TV, seeing you guys win games and stuff like that, it's just like, this is beautiful to see how our sport is growing mm -hmm. and the different kind of role models that we've got access to now and we're visible, that are visible, then we have access to and to see it continuously 
be on this path is really great. So I wouldn't say there's an unlikely role model because to be honest, I'm, I'm expecting us to be in these kind of spaces, um, but it's beautiful to see. Yeah, perfect. We love here at the Beehive Space to be bringing in as many people as possible to engage with the conversation. And so who better to kick it off with the Q&A and all the energy than someone who works here in the BSTN store is Tegan. Let's go Tegan. Thank you and um, thank you guys so much for all the gems you've been dropping today and um, we spoke a lot about things you've learned on your journey and I'm really interested to hear actually some things that you've had to unlearn to progress on your journey. Mm, great question. Oh, See that's what that like un unlikely. Yeah. <laughs> unlikely <laughs> role model. You, <laughs> oh man. Unlearn. Um, I don't know if you've heard the saying, um, pain is weakness leaving the body. No, it ain't. That's your body telling you to rest. <laughs> That's your body telling you to rest. Now, Caroline mentored me as a coach. So if you see any similarities, you know why. So Caroline mentored me um, before she left Brixton. And from all the coaches that we like, what was an injury? Like, get up, like, and keep going. At certain times, that's all good. But one of the things that I think, and you touched on it amazingly, and so did you when you were talking about self-care and looking after yourself is actually when you're not feeling okay it's okay it's not a sign of weakness it is okay to not be okay and i think that's one of the unlearning things one of the things like unlearning so when you feel overwhelmed when you feel tired it's okay to take a step back it doesn't mean that you're weak it means that you recognize your your threshold and your pressure point so i think that's one of the things that you know i'm unlearning and every now and then I forget. So when one of my players is like, oh, my ankle hurts, I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> you know, I'm unlearning. Yeah, OK, yeah, maybe she really is injured. <laughs> <laughs> Where was this when I was playing? <laughs> so, yeah. Love that. Thank you. So? Um, unlearning, yeah, similar to what Moji was saying, just like overdoing it and just pushing through. Yeah, you, there are ways of being mentally tough, but being able to set those boundaries for yourself mm -hmm. and like the self-care and recognizing um, when you do need to rest as well. Like I would, use, I would I'd be up all night watching the playoffs, get to bed at like 6 a.m., wake up for whatever at 9 a.m. and have like three hours sleep. And that's not the way mm -hmm. to function in the best way possible. Yeah. And so you can do it, but I've had to unlearn that those, those all-nighters and mm -hmm. Being able to just push through is not ideal. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be your optimal self, not just, oh, I, I, did it, I did it once and it worked. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's going to build up. So being able to just unlearn those bad habits mm -hmm. and actually be able to get the proper um, recovery and wellness mm -hmm. in for myself and people around me. Yeah, absolutely. How about yourself? You're not tired, you're just out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> Trigger. Trigger. <laughs> No, um, I'm sometimes, coach, take me out. I am tired. My legs are going to stop functioning. Give me a minute so I can come back in. But to be honest, like how you said yours as well, I think it's a generational thing too. Like I would say even beyond, like probably my brother would say like I'm soft, but the kids beyond me are soft. <laughs> like soft. But you have to you have to take care of them. You have to take care of them. Like if you want them to keep playing, if you want them to enjoy well, this. What's sport. their level of soft though? What's their threshold? Charming. Like, <laughs> like they nah, they're soft. Like I, I think I I challenge my kids, um, they had to make a certain amount of free throws. Uh, to to not run. Because um, one, uh, one of their teammates got in trouble talking while I'm talking. So I'm like, all right, your teammates can bail you out if they make the free throws. Mm -hmm. They make the free throws. OK, you just have to run. Run until I say stop. I think they did one lap of half court, and they were done. That's it. <laughs> like, that's it. We would have to do like suicides, lengths, like up and down, constant, pyramids, 70s, everything. But they, they don't understand what it takes. Like, they, even if they don't want to play basketball, they want to win games. Mm. And they don't fully understand what it takes to actually yeah. do that. Like, you have to be able to play 40 minutes mm -hmm. for most age groups. You have to be able to keep going and push through the tightness a little bit. But I do tell them, like, if you get tired, let me know so I can sub you out. <laughs> nah, yeah, that one. You're not, you're not tired, you're just out of breath. Mm. <laughs> 
And then she said trigger. Oh, <laughs> not the trigger. Thank you so much for your question. Yeah, really, really great question. Any more questions? Yeah, so I know that you guys obviously spoke from like a physical aspect of resting your body and everything like that. But Shanice touched earlier on just like the mental aspect of like, you know, needing your teammates at times. And I know that you obviously had to overcome injury. And obviously as a coach, you, are, you probably have a lot to mentally deal with because you have your players to worry about and yourself. So you're always putting people before you as well. So I just wanted to know like how you detox from that because I even struggled with that when I was in the States playing basketball. It was like I, I was struggling to find a way or something to like detox mentally and just clear my mind. So if you had anything that you did. Yeah, free up the gyms. Come on, coach. <laughs> um, I don't talk basketball. Um, yeah, when I need like to get away, um, like you said, and like being a coach, so it's not just the sessions. I think sometimes, because I'm as a player, um, I forget that the coaches have to deal with sorting out away games, making sure the kit's sorted, and it's just a headache. Um, so once the game's done uh, and I'm home, I, I, there's no more basketball talk for that, just for a period of time. Um, and you'll be surprised, and you, you coach games and stuff, right? Like you'll know, and you've coached at certain times. Sometimes after a game, you'll get home. You haven't played, you've coached. And you f you're like, why am I so tired? It's like you've played. <laughs> and then you look, oh, maybe it's all that shouting and like, your, your energy, your, the stand up the whole time, like you're in the game. So it's like, just, just pull back. Like I literally just, just, you know, pull back. And I'm of drinking age, so, you know, I'll have a glass or two or three, no, just a glass. But yeah, I'll just pull back from basketball. <laughs> why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> I promote responsible drinking, guys. I don't do three glasses. Yeah, but just no basketball talk. Just like, just detox. Like, just find something else outside of what's caused that stress um, to, to find yourself. Um, I'll, I'll follow up with what Moji was saying and... And when she mentioned stress, I don't like stress. Um, so I've got like a little system where it's like a wellness wheel. And I do regular check-ins uh, for myself, like just to know where I'm at on a monthly basis. If that's financially, spiritually, emotionally, um, socially, just as a, as a wellness wheel, like I, I, I check in to see how I am operating. And like sometimes if you do therapy, you get a score. So I do a check-in for myself just to know where I'm at and that helps you recognize things and it doesn't start to build up. So for instance, if I'm working too hard, it's like, okay, uh, I'm emotionally drained. That's a checkpoint. And so I know this, I'm able to like see it physically and correct it. Um, by doing a monthly check-in, I'm able to notice it. And if I consistently let it build up, that's a choice I'm deciding to make because I'm saying I'm, I've recognized it and I'm not doing anything about it. Whereas if you just put your head in the sand, then you're just gonna let things pile up until you get to a place where it's spiraling out of control. But what is it that you're doing like when you reach that checkpoint? Um, I'll give myself a score. So say for instance, I haven't been sleeping enough. Like, okay, maybe it's a score of one out of seven. And so I'll do checkpoints, do, do them regularly, but also decide what I'm gonna do about it. So if something's bothering me, write it down and so you know. And then now the next step is do something about it. So mentally, if you're not in a great place, at least you know, do something about it. And how can you do something about it? But at least if you're aware, I think a lot of problems come from not being aware of things and, and allowing it to build up. And so in terms of my mental space, if I've got a lot going on, at least I'm, I'm aware of being in that space, so I can either reach out for help, check in with friends and family, um, or actually do something about it. But having that awareness is good, not just um, for the moment, but long term as well, because it's so great when you're in a better place to look back and be like, wow, I overcame that. And look where I was. And actually, that felt like the end of the world, 
but now I'm here and it really wasn't. So just having that regular check-in with yourself is, is how I am able to help with my mental health. Mm, great, thanks, Sev. I think what um, Sevian said about the acknowledgement first is big. Like, I'm pretty sure, I think last year or the year before I experienced burnout and I was in it and I didn't know. Like, I was, com I was finished. Like, I took on too much and I, I was just done. So I had to keep going, but I was like a zombie. Like, I was just functioning purely because I had to, but my mind was elsewhere. So I think the, acknowledge the acknowledgement part is big. And then just finding something you truly enjoy, um, like experiment. Like, I bought myself a guitar during, uh, like, when I had COVID, <laughs> I think last year or the year before because I know I spend a lot of time with myself and that's something that I can do. And I also have a PS4, play online with some friends, like find something, find something that you enjoy doing, experiment, whether it's, if, if the money supports going out to eat with friends, then if you need to do that once a week, then go do it. Because if you know that keeps you here as opposed to here, then that's what you need to do. And um, I think anything creative is beneficial for everyone. Like, it doesn't matter what, it's do what you're doing. Like, if it's drawing, painting, if, I don't know, you're playing an instrument, whatever it is, I think creativity kind of gets you out that bubble as well, um, which I, I do like. I'm, I'm not an artist, <laughs> but, like, at times, I'll just get a pencil and just draw something or, like, get a canvas and start painting because it's, there's a therapy to it. Like, there's a certain... It stressed me out, but... <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's an element no, when it's when it's not when you're not an artist <laughs> it's therapy <laughs> but no yeah Sylvian's really 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 good at this de-stress stuff mm -hmm. just before Christmas I had like massive works like getting done to my house and like Sylvian had come to to visit me because I'd gone through whatever and the first thing she said she was like oh no 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 like she'd bought me all these bath stuff and she was like oh, you can come to my house and have a bath. <laughs> I was like, no, Sevian, I'm all right. She goes, no, you're going through too much already. Like, you need to be able to relax. Yeah, and yeah she's, me. I was like, what's this hippie doing in my house? Like, talking about, hey, come, hey, to, hey, talk about talk about come to my house and have a bath. I was like, and I was standing there, like, thinking, this is, this is Sevian. <laughs> when, when I say I, I don't, I she don't, don't do stress. stress. <laughs> Listen, you need to be in that good space, your mind, your energy, because... Do stress. I was just like, oh, here she goes. No, but honestly, when you're able to be in that space, people around you feel it. Yeah. And to have that good energy, I, I can feel like I'm a better person when I've got good energy. And the people around me will feel that too. And I'll, I like to be present. I don't like to have any stress. And so, for instance, the small things, like as Shanice said, being creative, having a hot bath, all the salts in it, put some music on, put some candles, turn off all the that's lights. A, that's exactly what she did. She was like, and the gift she bought me, she bought me um, some like bath stuff. Yeah, yeah. I was like, Seven, it's not going to be my space like forever. She goes, yeah, but you know, she goes, you know, I, I've moved, like, this is where I live. She was really pushing for this. I was like, I'm going to be at it. <laughs> the importance of self care is, is a different level with um, how you are and your mental space as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, sorry, on that one, making sure the space that you're in is clear so your mind is clear. Mm. Like, I get happy when I get gifted a new candle. <laughs> like, mm. just because I know, like, oh, okay, I'm going to clean my room today and light this candle and sit down and literally just be in my space. But, like, when there's, when there's clutter, it gets up here as well. Mm. Uh, we could go for hours and hours and hours, so thank you so, so much. We need part two, but don't worry, there's more episodes in the bag to come. So, ladies and gentlemen, please let me get a round of applause for my very special guest, for Moji in the house. these people let's go let's go let's go this has been episode one of a brand new panel series right here at the beehive so please do get involved follow us on all the socials to keep up to date this has been from the south and from the heart we'll be back with more episodes coming your way very very soon until next time see you later bye